It is Paranormal Tuesday, everybody, and today we are joined by the paranormal detective, Greg Lawson. Woo-hoo! So let's bring in Wendy. Let's bring in Greg, all the way from Austin, Texas, hanging out on a Tuesday What's up? night. Welcome. Good That's to right, see right. you. Yeah, Greg, we haven't um, talked to you a couple of times, but haven't seen you in person in forever. Uh, one Halloween one, was the last time I saw him. Yeah, want to see how? That's right. How have you been holding up um, during the whole uh, lockdown business? Um, well, um, you, you know, as far as my job goes, uh, nothing really changed. I just uh, we we threw in a couple of uh, uh, interesting little uh, policy changes and things like that, but uh, uh, COVID didn't do anything. Uh, the wow. other stuff has been very ir- irritating. <laughs> Aww. Understood. Well, yeah. let's start. Maybe we can start off for, for the, the uninitiated. I know yes. most of our, our fans and friends are familiar with you because mm-hmm. you've been on our program before. But, uh, Greg, can you tell everybody what it is that you do? So um, I'm a uh, career cop. Uh, I'm a lieutenant for a large uh, sheriff's office in Texas. And uh, I... Am in charge of the midnight shift. The exciting shift, right? That's when the weird stuff happens. Yeah. Well, okay. The right, the midnight. You know, I had a um, I had a roommate who was a police officer in Madison uh, for a while, and he specifically wanted the midnight shift, and he even requested the worst part of town because he was like, "Well, that's when it all goes down." And I want to, I'm here to help people. Oh boy. And that's that, that this is the place I can, you know, I can do my best. Why, why do you do the midnight shift, Greg? Because I'm the lowest ranking Lieutenant at our agency <laughs> and nobody else wants the job. <laughs> nice. Fair enough. Yeah. I went, I went from uh, Lake patrol, uh, um, recovery team, the dive team, oh. uh, you know, um, sunshine and, and happiness um, to, uh, yeah, just fumbling around in the dark. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, fumbling around in the dark is a little bit of what we're all doing in paranormal investigation. True. And, you know, one thing I always wonder about law enforcement officers and the paranormal is, and, and this, I, I, you know, I guess this is something that happened when, with one of my friends who um, was like a criminal justice major and he, and he was in a, uh, a group that was working in Milwaukee and he eventually was like, I don't believe anymore because all the reports we get and that we're going to are all just like abuse Mm. or all just drug addiction or all this kind of things. So, um, you know, how does, how does being someone involved in having to get the straight facts uh, get along with having to get the, I guess, the not-so-normal facts? So we just have a whole bunch of policies um, uh, that we go by and, uh, you know, very secular approach to how we deal with things. Um, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if it's some sort of what we would consider delusional, uh, we're going to look at whether the person has a history of this or whether they have some sort of intoxicant on board that's going to um, make them see or hear these things. And uh, we're going to kind of work it from there. Um, the thing that I have to re- remind people all the time is just because somebody has a mental illness doesn't mean they're not experiencing what they're saying they're experiencing. Just because, um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. And so, you know, you don't, 
I, I talk to people all the time about, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, how can you be a cop and, and, uh, and do the paranormal investigation? Well, I have to keep it very separate, uh, what I do. And uh, my investigations have to be airtight of, of, of what I investigate. So when I look at these different things, I have to come at any kind of really good investigator has to come from a skeptical point. Uh, because you ha only have two other choices. You have cynical point or you have true believer point that it doesn't matter what kind of uh, evidence you're going to give this person. They're going to say, no, it was grandma. The, the orb was, you know, uh, <sighs> cousin, uh, you know, the demon came in and knocked over my China. So let's talk about uh, that. Let's talk about that difference for a second, though. Like, OK, so you were just saying that the demon came in and knocked over your China or right. I saw the orb <laughs> and it was grandma saying hi. Um, yeah. And that's the true believer point. And I think that we've obviously got a lot of them and met a lot of people like that. What's the, okay, and the, the, what's the difference between the cynical and the skeptical uh, perspective so that we're, we're keeping our minds open um, and not either too far closed or, you know, like a bucket where our brains just right. spill out all over the floor? So if, if you look at, um, if let's say, if, if we had cynical on one side and gullible on the other side, a skeptic is going to go someplace here in the middle based on the evidence, their training, and their experience. So a skeptic, when you say, hey, I saw a ghost, a skeptic's going to say, well, what happened? How did, where were you? What, what was mm. going on? Mm. A Cynic is going to go, <laughs> okay, what's for lunch? What do y'all want to do? And they're going to want to <laughs> get away from you. Uh, and, uh, and, and a gullible person is just going to go, that's cool. You know? Right. And that's cool too. Don't, I'm not, I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm just sure. saying that that's, that's your range that you're going to have. The skeptic is going to want to ask questions and want to, uh, try to put this thing together in his head. Um, and that's the thing that, Michael Shermer with uh, Skeptic Magazine. I don't know if he's still with Skeptic oh, absolutely. Magazine. I, I really like him a lot. I like listening to his stuff. I like uh, reading his material. I've taken courses from him. The problem is, is Michael is not a skeptic. Michael is a cynic. Yes. And I, and I love him and I respect him. I do. And he would argue with me on this point. But when he, uh, when he gives a talk, he'll say, Things like, and when the ghosts come out of the house. Right. No, he, he is like that. And yeah, he's so, almost like that guy back from the 1970s, Philip Class with the UFO debunker. So like Michael Shermer, who I think is, I mean, he's the guy that if I wanted to try and be like, here is incontrovertible evidence of something. Michael Shermer is yeah. the guy I'd want to convert. I want to get him and Richard Dawkins in a room and be like, all right, boys, we're going to get into this. Yeah. Um, Let's get some. But he reminds me the ultimate of, victory. <laughs> he reminds me of Philip Glass, uh, who used to be on Larry King and stuff. And used, his job was just to be the devil's advocate in every single situation to mm. be like, OK, well, it might have been this. It might have been this. Like, let's That's get so easy. <laughs> it is. And let's get all of that out of the way before we can finally get to. No, now this is yeah. something we can't explain. And when it's something we can't explain, it's something interesting. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, frustrating for me whenever I, I uh, talk with or deal with somebody that wants to share a story with me um, and they share a story and it's so amazing. It's a freaking great story. Uh, and then I ask questions and then they get mad because... They feel like I'm, you know, questioning them or trying to debunk them. Uh, I'm not a debunker, but if it's not paranormal, it's not paranormal. Right. Um, if you're, if if you've never been, in, um, if you've never been diagnosed with any kind of mental illness, you've never had a head injury, you've never uh, taken any kind of uh, illicit drugs that may cause a flashback at a later time, and you uh -oh. say. Yeah, I know. I'm just hanging. <laughs> uh, that's y'all. You'll always have something to blame. Nice. And uh, it, but you're sitting there, and you you or the person says they were sitting there, and they saw their deceased father walk in, give him a hug, and tell him he loved him, uh, and he can't explain everything, but just know that he'll see him soon, and he disappears. 
that would change my life. That would that would change my belief system. That would uh, just absolutely change yeah. everything. And and when I bring that up and somebody gets mad about it, it's like, wait, man, don't get mad. I haven't experienced what you've experienced. So that's mm-hmm. that's why I I try to talk to other paranormal investigators that when they talk to somebody who has had an experience, even if they're mentally ill or been diagnosed with some sort of mental illness um, or they were on drugs, take the information. You don't know whether whatever's going on in their head at the time, whether it's chemical or, or physiological is creating a bridge someplace to where you can actually experience something outside of the normal. That's right? that, that's a Terrence McKenna. Yeah. That that idea that um, psilocybin and stuff like that would you know open yourself up to those kind of experiences. You know, I think you made a great a great point right there though. Um, and this is something because we've all seen so many horror movies. You know, we've all seen so many uh, paranormal TV shows and stuff like that. That. As soon as we, ex, you know, accept that or would see something like this, your entire view of reality will change. Like all of a sudden it moves from a materialist perspective to right. like, uh-oh, yeah. uh-oh. Like it's, <sighs> it's bigger than that or it's changed or life after death is a real thing or, okay, UFOs. Mm, I guess they were right. Yeah, that's a paradigm shift. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and I, I was talking with Brooks Barley earlier. He was a uh, one of the cameramen for Ghost Hunters in season 11, I think. Hmm. And uh, he went in. Uh, he had built a, a, a drone for them, and he didn't know anything about ghost hunting, nothing like that. And uh, um, the DP asked him, said, hey, man, you ever want to come in here and uh, and work some? I'll, I'll hire you as a uh, cameraman. And he went in. Uh, completely sterile, completely devoid of uh, any bias, any assumptions, any expectations. Uh, And they uh, made him the B-roll guy and stuck him down in dungeons all by himself. (laughs) Right, the person they never talk about. You always see like, ooh. Like, no, the guy that's actually having the paranormal experience is the cameraman, everybody. That's right. He he didn't know when he signed up for that job. (laughs) Yeah. he, he said, man, a- after doing that for a season, his ideas completely changed. Oh, his experience that he had was something way beyond the, what he was expecting. Mm, cool. Yeah. You know, he's a good guy. You know, that's awesome. You know, one thing I'm, I have met um, a variety of different law enforcement officers who have had paranormal experiences and they can't. And even though their job is to, you know, just the facts, ma'am, like Joe Friday or whatever from Dragnet, like they have <laughs> had things that are like, okay, I can't explain this and are open to it, even though they need to be pretty hard nosed about those things in, mm-hmm. in regular life. Um, do you remember your first investigation? Um, was it, either if it was a paranormal investigation or if it was a law enforcement ve- investigation where you were like, okay, there's something here that goes beyond just a prowler or a break in, or, you know, they, they called in something that might be paranormal. And where does a police officer or law enforcement officer, sheriff, you know, where do they go when, um, you can't just lock the bad guy up. So we're pretty much outside of that. Like I said, uh, in during an investigation, we have a very secular view. Law enforcement has a very secular view of what's going on uh, and a very pragmatic view of what's going on uh, because that's our job. Our People say, you know, well, why do you want to be a cop? Well, I want to go help people. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> there's, there's so many different things to do to go help people other than be a cop. But people say, well, what do you do as a cop? You know, you arrest people, you, you impound cars, you do this. I solve problems. Wait, impounding, you, impounding my car is never yeah. solving a problem, Greg. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I, okay, I create problems. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but, I mean, that's what we do. We have a very limited amount of time 
to take care of this. And so we get called, individuals in the community call us to a location or we're patrolling a location. We identify it, we go over and we stick to policy, policy and procedure and, and hopefully we stick to the law and case law and that sort of thing. But we try to stay inside of that. When I was a mental health investigator, I did mental health investigations for about two years and that's a cop that doesn't wear a uniform. Uh, and that all the other cops call him to come deal with the people that are having uh, delusions, uh, hallucinations, trying to kill themselves. Dude, that's that a sort tough, of stuff. Wow. That's got to be the toughest job in the world. Yeah. It's a very interesting job. I, I did it for about two years. And, uh, you know, you're a hostage neg negotiator. You're a suicide mediator. You're a, a social worker. You're, a, you know, uh, constantly deferring people. You need to know what's going on in your community to be able to get people help because, after the Dehospitalization Act, um, uh, about 1984, when they kicked all these people out of the mental health and institutions. That's and, because and, they said you couldn't just um, commit people anymore, right? Right. And that yeah. was that if, was if done. They were not, that was if they were not a immediate danger to themselves or others, you can't you can't lock them up. So all the people that. Uh, had cognitive issues or coping issues that would have been, let's say in the state school or at the, at the state hospital, they were released on the street. And that's what, what has really attributed to a lot of our homeless population. So when we're called out to stuff like that, we have to stick inside of liability and we have to do um, our due diligence. So, if somebody's saying that they are possessed by a demon and they're surrounded by their, their church family um, and they're, they're trying to exercise the demon um, or doing uh, some sort of exorcism or something, um, there's a certain point that we take over and go, no, nope, we're going to get them medically cleared first. Is that so, something that happens where people, I mean, cause I, I mean, on Reddit, at least I see all the time, people are like, I think I'm possessed. And oh, yeah. do yes. people call the police when they think of something like that? Uh, normally they call friends and family and, and uh, churchgoers and, and people that they're involved with. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of ghost hunters that have had this experience will call other ghost hunter or paranormal investigators to, uh, to make decisions uh, on how, how they want to go. But for us on law enforcement, we're going to go, yeah, you know, that's a priest's deal. And if he can't handle it, let's go get you cleared because – um, not Scientology cleared. <laughs> not, no, no. Okay. Just make no, it sure. Let's make sure that you're not, uh, suffering from, uh, uh epilepsy. Let's make sure mm. that you don't have a, uh, a lesion or a tumor mm. that would be causing you to, uh, to have these delusions or hallucinations. Let's get that taken care of for, so we try to eliminate all of the, uh, uh, the normal stuff before we go to the paranormal. Now I, ha I have cops come to me and tell me about things that I would never uh, break their confidentiality, but it's, it's, it's cathartic for them. It's uh, a psychologist, I guess, uh, because they'll come to me and go, Hey, can I, can I talk to you in private? You know, the one-on-one -on -one? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and they'll tell me their stuff. Now, most of their stuff that they're experiencing, um, psychologically wise are probably PTSD and PTSD is a lot more prevalent in military law enforcement than uh, politicians and, and, and other people uh, would like to say. Sure. Uh, but it comes across in very small ways, being argumentative, being dis, you know, disassociative, being dis, disconnected from their family, not talking as much. And it also can manifest itself in dreams, dream state, disrupt your sleep, uh, and, uh, you know, I have, I've had cops come up to me and tell me every night before they go to sleep, they see an apparition, they see someone else in the room and that someone else in the room is related to an experience that they had. Uh, and you know, it's better just to close their eyes, try to go to sleep and, uh, forget about it, uh, or self-medicate or whatever they're doing, you know? Right. So, yeah. And, you know, I, speaking of Terrence McKenna, like that's the whole, the new, they're hoping that some of these um, psychedelic treatments can help people rewire their brain to maybe get past those kinds of things. Yeah. And you hope that when the talking cure doesn't work, as it seems to when we've seen the, the, 
the uh, suicide rate for veterans and things like that. We would hope yeah. that we could find some other way to help those people who we have to put in the harm's way so that I, Wendy and I can make dumb songs and stuff like that and be goofy, <laughs> you know, and have fun. You got to send me that song. I don't think you ever sent me that song, did you? I We might have, but uh, that was the song we were playing in the intro, and that is The Captured Soul, <laughs> uh, which we wrote after the first time we interviewed Greg last year uh, based on an experience he oh, had yeah. as a, like a manager of a pizza hut. And that yeah. was on episode 250. So if you want to check it out, it's uh, othersidepodcast.com slash 250. You can hear uh, more of Greg's mm -hmm. great stories, including the pizza hut. You know, but also, <laughs> I, you know, I, I keep thinking back to that because as we're working on some new paranormal investigation stuff and, and we're, you know, getting into some of our stuff our own, like Greg, one of the things that you talked about was like the first thing I do is I turn the power off. Like when you do a paranormal investigation and I was yeah. like, that was the first, you know, you're the first guy I ever talked to who was like, yeah, how about the power guys? Like, let's make sure we don't have, <laughs> we don't have electricity running through the hall, like running through every little thing Seriously, in the no. house. Um, that seems to take out a big, uh, a big, what if, you know, a, you know, a big variable at least. Yeah, I've, I've been to a lot of, uh, obviously, a lot of different places. Uh, I've gone with big groups. I've gone with small groups. I, I typically, if it's a, if it's an actual investigation that I'm doing, I'm doing it by myself. I, I don't want any other distraction. I just want me, if I'm going to trick myself, I'll let myself get tricked. But I don't want somebody else to, uh, to do or say or, you know, move or stomach growl or whatever. And I come up with something, something really weird. So, um, I, I watch a lot of folks and, um, you know, they'll, they'll use their K2 meters to, to find a ghost and they'll, they'll walk under the, uh, the ballast of a, uh, fluorescent light and their K2 meters going off like crazy. And it's like, yeah, that nothing, but they say, yeah, you know, I'm getting a lot of activity here. It's like, yeah, you need to know what's causing that activity and the ballast in that that fluorescent light is doing that or they leave their cell phone on and their GPS ping keeps going right. off <laughs> and they're getting, I mean, there's just all these different things. So I just shut everything off and go in and experience it firsthand. Um, at least like if, if there's, if there's food in the house, I'll shut it and you know, I'll get permission, but I shut everything off, uh, for at there's least food in the house, so. you'll eat it. Right, well, he goes like, oh, the dark. The, he's like, the damn, oh, I need to do this alone, everybody. I the need damn to ghosts alone. ate all your Hershey's. <laughs> I don't know what happened to those miniatures. Yeah, but they left the Mr. Good bars, but they ate all the crackles. What? Whatever. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, I respect that because that's often my biggest complaint, I guess, with ghost hunts is when you're in a group situation, it's almost impossible to filter out the either the chatter the other devices, the stomach's growling, um, and even just people, you know, if you're recording any audio, footsteps, et cetera. So if it's just you, you trust yourself to not, you know, taint the evidence. But so, so uh, means you got to be really brave, Greg, because <laughs> most of the places that we do investigations are not ones that I am very excited about going in by myself. Right. <laughs> right. When you're scared. No, I get it. I I, and I watch people like I'll, I'll, I'll be over in Europe and um, be doing a, 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 a VIP investigation kind of thing. And I'm taking people through something. And here these people have paid thousands of dollars to get on an airplane, fly to fly to England, uh, stay in a really cool hotel and walk around in the dark and stare at their phone or stare <laughs> at their phone. Stare at their, you right. know, whatever box they're using or whatever. And it's like, man, put that away and have the experience. I, I'm pretty sure, you know, we've been we've been um, collecting, and I say we, I mean, people other than me and humanity uh, throughout thousands of years have been uh, have been investigating this and wondering the, the spirit world and religion and all the rest of that stuff. And we have those stories. Our, our society has those stories from from 3000 years ago of miraculous things that happened, strange things that happened. So I believe that we're already uh, pretty much pre-wired to pay attention and to have these experiences. It's nice to have some electronics along the way if you can capture it, 
But I haven't seen anything captured on electronic stuff that's just overwhelming. Oh, my God, this is what it is. Right. Uh, yeah. Because it'll typically be a third copy of a video. And I got to have the original video because I have to know when I when I bring it into a, a system, I have to know whether those uh, those little digital pixels have been manipulated. Well, right. And you can't do that with a cop. And this is what so. I think when we see stuff on the Internet, you know, like how much of this would stand up in court and how much of it would just be like bringing in some kind of expert, you know, who's a, in in video or special effects. Mm -hmm you know, versus like, we looked at the, you know, we looked at the MPEG and this is what we decided. Like when we're dealing with stuff that's like coming over from Thailand or Russia or anything. And everybody's like, look at this amazing footage. And you're just yeah, like, it's amazing. you're like, of course it's amazing. It's called after effects. Right. And <laughs> well, they're, also, they're really good at that too. Greg yeah. makes a really good point too, though, that I never really considered the fact that when you transfer files, you know, unless you're doing the uh, the verification that all the bits are <laughs> that are supposed to be there have arrived, like you know, data ah. gets compressed and uncompressed in file transfer, and so that could potentially cause things to look differently or you know, subtly Absolutely. be yep. different. Uh, what, uh, yep. You know what? I never even thought about YouTube compression, Facebook compression. Yeah, yeah. Like you're not watching Skype compression. <laughs> right. We're dealing with Skype compression right now. We're not dealing with raw data. We're dealing with what, what right. we're dealing with predictive data and predictive data is like pareidolia. Predictive data wants us it expects to see faces. It expects to see human bodies and it expects to um, uh, predict the movement of those bodies. So, yep. Well, it, also that's the SLS camera. Yeah. When also, I mean, even if just a couple pixels are lost or something, you know, you, Suddenly, there's a hey, look, there's something floating behind Wendy. <laughs> right. You know, it's it's like it could just be something very subtle. But when we're picking these things apart the way that paranormal investigators do, you're looking for any kind of little tiny, teeny tiny clue. And so that's just that's an interesting, really interesting point, Greg, that mm -hmm. having the actual file that was, you know, created by the capturing device is different than having something that might have been transferred multiple times. Well, it's amazing how many uh, photographs of orbs came along with digital photography. Uh, <laughs> right. we, we've been using analog photography or film photography forever. And, uh, you know, every once in a while there's, a, there's an orb, but nothing like with digital photography. Mm. So uh, digital photography is finding grandma a lot better than analog <laughs> photography. <laughs> you know, an interesting thing is that I was um, doing some research on the, uh, the, the brown lady picture. Mm -hmm. You know, that classic picture of the woman coming down the staircase. And there was research done by the Society for Psychical Research in uh, England back in the 1930s when the picture was taken. And they were like, they thought it was a fraud. They thought it was a setup for this magazine who had sent the reporters there specifically to find ghost photos. And so the um, photojournalists found those ghost photos, but then they ended up finding like a different picture of the Virgin Mary that looked just like, like was the same shape and everything of the brown lady. And, the, mm. and like I always thought the brown lady because it was, by the time we got to the 1970s, which were the books that I had read that had that picture in there, like that was just mm -hmm. like, this is a straight up ghost photo. This is the real deal. Yeah. So you look at those pictures of the brown lady, you're like, Holy crap. Like you see yeah. that and you're like, this is because those guys probably had like a thing on there. Like they had the, the camera set up and there was a, a veil over the back of their head and they just take the picture and then whatever happened, it showed up and they had no technology or whatever. Well, yeah, they had technology for special effects. King Kong was already made by the time the right. brown lady photo was taken. Sure. Hmm. And so it just it just got you know, interesting that also context, because we never hear about the Society for Psych Research formed by like guys like William James and stuff like that. People who took science seriously. Wonder um, why. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we just hear about the photo. 
And, and when you see, you grow up, you see the photo, you're like, that shit is real, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I love those guys. I, I think they're doing great work over there. Um, and, and the thing about it is, is, um, I'm for everything. If you want to go and create a, uh, a spirit box that, uh, randomly scans, you know, radio stations and, and gives you a second of each radio station that it scans and you want to do some experiments on that. That's fine. Um, it's actually a hell of a lot more interesting than sitting in a dark room doing nothing. <laughs> you know, right. You know, uh, hoping, but hoping for the best. Understand or the what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Greg, real quick. Um, when we first got on, I believe Wendy was like cool Ouija board. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we were looking uh, in the back. And so, we're like, obviously, you're in a great room. Creature from the Black Lagoon. Got the day the uh, earth is still. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and then you got a Ouija board on the wall. And so, Wendy goes, cool Ouija board. And then you go, like, oh, that's a long story. Let's get to the sound check. And I'm like, wait, there's a Ouija board with a long story. Now we got to hear it. So I was just kidding. <laughs> Fair <laughs> awesome. enough. Fair enough. Let's just talk about the Creature from the Black Lagoon. It makes it so much more intriguing when it ha when you think there's a long story behind it. <laughs> no, man. I, I uh, So I was over in England. I was uh, doing some stuff at Warwick Castle. and at, Oh, yeah, um, probably with MJ? Yeah, uh, actually, yeah. yeah MJ, MJ, she's fantastic. Awesome. And, uh, and so um, one of the guys that was there uh, had a big display of Ouija boards. And uh, I haven't really messed with Ouija uh, all that much since like high school. You know, we used to go out in the graveyard and do Ouija board and stuff like that. But I, I haven't really messed with them too much, uh, at, almost at all since then. And uh, this particular guy uh, at the end of the show, I, I was packing up to leave and he just walked over and he handed me this thing. Wow. Now, this is a handmade really cool Ouija board that is Celtic and it has dogs and cats on it. <laughs> and I'm a big dog and cat guy. Sure. And, uh, he just walked over and said, um, you're supposed to have this. And <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, it was, it's expensive. It's a, it's a handmade, it's really right, nice it's a talking board. Right. I would love to be able to get up and walk over there and, and, and bring it back over here and show it to you. The problem is I can't walk. So Aww. I know it's sad and it? it's sad. I saw you had some pretty cool looking bracelets there. I thought maybe you went to the water park or something. Oh yeah. Look at this. I'm a uh, fall. <laughs> where, where is it? Where am I? Oh, there, there, there you go. go. Look, I'm a fall risk. Look at this. Fall. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Greg, are you okay? <laughs> are you going to be all right there? No, I just do are, weird stuff. Are it's you like possessed? Whenever, it, w whenever I was in the military, whenever I was, uh, uh, you know, in law enforcement, um, I never wear boots unless I got promoted. So I would wear that same <laughs> pair of boots, whether it wow. had holes in it or not, until I got transferred or promoted. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to shave my beard or take these off until I'm back on full duty. So that's All about right. five wow. months from now, probably. Okay. I, okay. you know, I, tr and, I tried to a... not shave my beard when the pandemic started and then it got too big. And then my wife was like, yeah, shave your beard or, or your marriage is going to end before the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> that's what uh, my what behavior I modification unit said earlier tonight. <laughs> uh Oh, Behavior modification unit, nice. And and just so everybody isn't too concerned, I mean, we're all very concerned, of course, but it was a surgery that you had that you're recovering from. It wasn't like, right? Yeah, you it wasn't weren't attacked. Don't you think I was <laughs> like, uh, it was a paranormal stuck. thing. Ed Warren uh, over here, Ed, Ed Warren over here was hurt. So, um, the doctor thinks that I, I had multi, you know, cause I, I did, uh, I, w I was a paratrooper in the army for four years and I, I did competition skydiving oh, for about 18 wow. years. Woo! And so, yeah, the, yeah, the doctor, uh, when he operated on it, um, so long story short, I was walking down the stairs and my knee oh. just blew out. My oh. kneecap went up into my thigh and I oh. fell and, and yeah, and, 
it was it was enjoyable. That sounds horribly <laughs> oh, unpleasant. I'm so sorry. And being a man, I shoved my kneecap back in place, straightened my leg out. <gasps> yeah. Hopped, hopped into the kitchen and got the bowl of cherries that I was going to get. No. And I ate one cherry without throwing up because it <laughs> hurt like hell. <laughs> Hopped back upstairs. Lynn was freaking out. You know, because oh, I, she, I screamed course. like crazy, you Look know. Oh, pain, my gosh. Pain. And I hopped back upstairs, took a shower, and then she took me to the emergency room. So oh my gosh. I blew my whole patellar tendon, all the oh. attachment parts. So yeah. So anyway, enough of that. I, that happened. No. That happened to our guitar player one time when we yeah. were in rehearsal. Yeah. And uh, we, we're so the, we witnessed it. We know how we we were, we've witnessed someone in that much pain, and we it was were, awful. We're so playing us. We're playing so a song, sorry. and this is back in the dorms. We're in the dorms, and in the dorms they let us practice in these like music rehearsal rooms at midnight on a Wednesday. In the basement. In the basement. We're down in the basement. We're working on something. Our guitar player tries to do like a kick. Like he's practicing a move and then he kicks oh, yeah. out and then he's on the floor and then he played through the rest of the chorus, but we got to the, we get to the verse and then I just hear like this <laughs> and I'm like, oh, he's, God. he's really rocking out. And I then, heard, all I heard was call 911 <laughs> and then like, oh my God. And then we look and his, like his kneecap is like on his chin. Yeah. And we're, we're like, yeah. he's done. And we had yeah. to, you know, we'd take him. The, 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 and I wrote, that's the only time I've been in the ambulance. Is I rode with him in the ambulance to the um, hospital. So you, uh, you get a full knee replacement. You'll be walking in three months. You get a patellar injury and it's six months to nine oh months. Holy gosh. cow. Holy cow. Because it's got to all get reattached and all that stuff. Wow. So. Oh, so sorry, man. All right. Well, yeah, you uh, know, it, it don't feel sorry for me. I'm I'm all right. I I'm, it sucks having to take up all of my sick time and vacation time instead of doing uh you know workers' comp. If it would have happened at work, that would have been sweet. Oh, Lynn says, oh, I like man. how you turned your knee injury into a skydiving incident. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> Hi, Lynn. So you know, I mean, a, a wild thing never feels sorry for itself, my friend. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh gosh. Well, I'm glad you're still smiling. Yes. Yeah. Through it all. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, Greg, we're looking, you know, when we look at your background here, uh, you got Day There Is Still, classic, Creatures and Blast Lagoon, classic. And you've also written a couple of books and stuff yourself. Um, just wondering what from your paranormal research and investigation has affected the art you have created like so wendy and i are always creating this silly art based on the people we talk to the stuff we've seen the paranormal events that we've experienced you know what paranormal events have influenced the stuff that you created too so um wow uh that's a that's a great question mike <laughs> hey i do what i can So the actual events, um, I have a bunch of artwork up in my head I want to do. Um, and some of that comes from a, a paranormal perspective. Uh, there's a couple of songs uh, that I've wanted to write. I've, I've, I've written a, a, a few songs and there's a couple of songs I've wanted to write uh, that relate to um, friends of mine that have died and strange things that have happened and places we've been and, and that sort of thing. But you know, I've been so busy doing other stuff. I've been so busy uh, writing uh, uh, the, you know, the Disorient Express and the Carrion. Those are my two fiction novels that are based on true experience, but they're they're fiction novels. Uh, and then my paranormal books, as far as the zombie advocacy book, uh, and uh, how to be a paranormal detective, and then uh, uh, the paranormal diaries or diaries of a paranormalist. Um, most of that I, I, I transfer into my writing as opposed to uh, anything else, really. So did that answer your question? Kind of. I, yeah, I was so. just wondering if there was something in that you experienced in general that you had, like, I need to transfer this to a way that I can share it with people. 
um, that might be best served through fiction or best served through, like you were seeing, you know, like your fiction work that was uh, based on experiences that happened. Was it something that you had felt um, or in your lived experience that you were like, okay, if I just give my life story, nobody's going to care, but I want to try to fictionalize it to right. make people understand it a little better. Right. Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the, the book I wrote, The Disorient Express, uh, is about my experiences when I was a mental health officer. So I relate to a lot of the strange calls I went to, the, the, you know, the weird occurrences, a lot of uh, suicide, a lot of death. Um, you know, there was, there was one, uh, I don't, I don't think I put it in the Disorn Express. I don't believe I, I, I don't remember, but anyway, um, I, uh, I got called to a woman who was uh, suffering from postpartum depression. She was going to throw her baby off the third story of the, oh uh, ap apartment balcony. So she's up on the, sure. on her apartment balcony with this baby holding it oh. over the edge. And, uh, the police had arrived. No, uh, there no was no pressure, police. Greg. Huh? No pressure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Save the baby. Seriously, how awful. That's yeah. So and yeah, it so sounds like an screaming. easy day at work. You just be in a band. It's easy. <laughs> she's screaming and she's, everybody get away from me. I'm oh going to drop God. them and blah, 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 you know, all that. Oh and so uh, there were some cops down at the bottom kind of getting a blanket together to try to catch the baby. Um, and then there was a couple of cops inside the apartment right by the sliding glass door that were kind of guarding her and not letting her go back into the apartment. Um, and so I pulled up, you know, the SWAT team is there and fire department, EMS, everybody's there's a big crazy scene. And I park and I, I'm walking up uh, the sidewalk that's approaching toward uh, the apartment complex, uh, her, her apartment building. And her apartment building, she was on the third floor and there was an external staircase that if you're outside on the balcony, you can see people walk up the stairs. So I walked by the, uh, the perimeter officers that were standing there, identified myself and I went up and I, I had been called out for the uh, negotiation part of this. And so I'm working my way up the stairs and I'm looking at her and she's looking at me. I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. You know, I, I come back out. I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. I go back into the the hallway, go down to her door, perimeter officer's there at the door, he lets me in. I walk up to the sliding glass door and the two officers were standing there and they were the ones that were talking with her initially, but she had turned around and was staring at me and they were about to introduce themselves and introduce me to her and I just walked between them, walked straight up to her, she handed me the baby, I turned around, handed it to the officer, she gave me a big hug. I gave her a big hug and I walked her out and I walked her down to my car, put her in the back seat of my car, took her straight to the state hospital crisis stabilization unit and signed her in the hospital. And that was it. Oh my gosh. Um, I, about I even... two months later, I was at the state hospital for a mental health hearing and I had to go to one of the wards cause they couldn't take this person off. They're, they're hearing so the judge and everybody was had to go out to the ward and as i was walking through one of the wards as i was getting there i was walking through one of the wards uh i hear this woman you're an angel and i turned around and there's the lady that had the baby you know and she's like oh my god you're an angel and she runs up to me and she gives me a big hug and i said thanks you know I'm, I'm glad you're okay i'm glad everybody's okay she goes no no you are an angel you came to me with a halo with wings. You were glowing. You were an oh angel. You were sent to me. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's that's trippy, right? Yeah. Like that story that story is so intense, even just the, you know, retelling what happened, but then to hear it from that perspective of what she was experiencing, that's wow. <laughs> right. So the the question is, um, am I an angel? <laughs> well, don't hey, ask my wife. I think Let's we know the out. answer to that. Yes. <laughs> um, did an entity use me to solve this problem? Hmm. Uh, or was she hallucinating and doesn't have anything to do with anything? Well, I mean, does Good it questions? The thing is, does it matter? 
The only thing that matters it matter is, that that kid, yeah. is, that, is that kid came out, right? The kid right, came out but okay. for the sake of conversation. <laughs> sure. Could it be? <laughs> Those are I mean, great questions. But that idea, though, well, it's, it's God or whoever you, you like. I grew up Catholic, but everybody grows up in their own kind of thing. Is God I'm or whatever a, um, acting through you? You know what I mean? Is that is was it that moment that you happened to be the right vessel at the right time? And that that's what God the Catholic inside of me believed. I mean, you know, that, that that's <laughs> what the Catholic inside of me would would tell me to believe. And so I think that um, obviously, uh, you know, those kind of things where she's having a hallucination or something and postpartum is very dangerous, very real. Yeah. Um, and then you're like, what do you, you know, the other officers must have been like, what the hell is this guy? What did he do? I'm like, the you know, man. Right. <laughs> like I had, Obviously, I, had the the, I had the 24 hours of mandatory training and he just walks in and gets this baby <laughs> safe. Just right in between everybody. And gra- like, no hey, problem. I was that cynic smug looking at him with the big, <laughs> right. <laughs> I got this baby, no problem. Okay, so Greg, was there a situation in law enforcement where maybe the opposite occurred? Maybe where um, did your open mind lead you to make a mistake or not investigate something or investigate the wrong lead? Um, Was there ever a point where your open mind was too far open where something may have not uh, you you're like, Oh, I I bet I could have done that better. Yeah. I really want to say that. So my internal affairs unit can get a hold of (laughs) it. That's that's a great question. Fair Um, enough. Maybe. I mean, there has to be something. There has to be something outside. What's wrong of, with you? <laughs> there has to be something outside, like the it's seven years, right? That'd be something in like 2011. You could talk about. You it's know? like a job interview. I, I don't think there's any statute of limitations on policy violations, so we're just gonna go. Ahead All right, and move fair on. enough. No, but I, you know, I just I think of the mistakes I've made. Because oh, well, if I had trusted uh, people, I trusted the wrong people, or I was like, I like, I think they have a point. And then I like, no, they're just of course, foolish. yeah, uh, of course. There's a, there's a point that you uh, have to rely on other people's expertise. That's that's the problem with a lot of law enforcement. Well, it's actually it's a problem with a lot of people, is they think they know what the right thing to do is, instead of deferring to the expert. If mm. the expert tells me to wear a mask, I'm going to wear a mask. It sucks. I don't want to, but you know what? It makes some other people feel better when I have a mask on and especially if they're immune compromised. So that's what I'm going to do. So I try to stay within my bailiwick of my expertise and defer to other people. And sometimes these other people aren't necessarily, uh, you know, maybe consider their advice might not be the best. Um, so yeah, there's, I, I can I can give you another horror story. This one didn't turn out well at all. Okay. Um, well, we'll we'll do one horror it, story and then one good story. Not a happy ending. So we'll do a horror <laughs> story and then we'll end it off on a good story. I'm gonna drop. If there's anybody watching right now, let's say get we got 50 people watching. There's gonna be three people watching at the end of this. All right, hold on one oh, second great. before that's, you. That's bef- what we're going for. Before great. you Thanks. go before you go that way, MJ comes in. She's like three of my favorite people in the universe. And she even spelled it. Oh, she even spelled it favorite oh. in the UK way, right? <laughs> yeah. The O U. So we love you too. Oh, she's awesome. We love you too. Yes. So sweet. And so okay. Um, well, <laughs> hit us with the hammer, son. Uh, let's let's see how many viewers we can drop. Yes. <laughs> Go for it, Greg. All right. So um, uh, I got a call to a. Uh, uh, th- this was many years ago in. Uh, um, uh, that, this would have been back in the 80s. And uh, um, I got a call to a woman who we would go out and see all the time. And uh, it, it typically was, it, 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 she was depressed. She was, uh, um, sh- she had some bipolar stuff going on. 
And so it was always a very stressful interaction, whatever it is. And uh, she would have, um, even with her bipolar, she would have some hallucinations sometimes. But her her main her main thing was depression. And so I got called, and I knocked on the door uh, of her apartment, and she didn't come to the door. And I'm announcing myself, you know, and and I it, it was just in the evening. The sun had just set, and I heard something thump inside the the apartment, and some sort of metal thing make a noise. And then her, uh, her curtains on her window became very orange and lit up. Uh, and they were kind of flickering. And uh, I just kind of assumed that something bad had happened. And I kicked open the door, which wasn't a good idea because that I let a lot of uh, fresh air into the room and she had um, dropped a can of gasoline and decided oh, to burn herself. Wow. Yeah. So me coming in the room uh, and the fresh breeze and all that stuff didn't do real well. And it completely consumed her. Um, I'm giving her commands to get on the ground, get on the ground. And uh, there was a couch right there. And there was a blanket on the back of the couch. I grabbed the blanket and I threw it on her. And I realized once I threw it on her, it was made out of a, of a nylon. Of, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's those things where it's, you have a, a split-second decision to, to make a decision. And you go to your training and you go, yeah, you know, blanket, get something on her, smother the flames. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what the blanket's made out of. Right, because those nylon, the, that's like the, the Snuggie. Yeah. It's made out of that uh, fleece. That's Wait, the Snuggie totally... is dangerous? Yeah, be careful. It was, it was like a, yeah, it was like a fleece kind of thing. It yeah, was, I'm going to um, have to get rid I, of my I, Weezer Snuggie. I, I take that back. It was, it was a, uh, it was a polyester weave is what it was. Mm. And oh, so I, I got to get rid of some uh, wigs then. Yeah. <laughs> it turned into plastic. And, uh, oh, so, oh my God. you know, so as that's... far as making bad decisions, I don't know if that's a good example of, uh, making a poor decision based on somebody else's, uh, information or on a paranormal event. But I mean, it's right there. Anytime you're doing any of this stuff, the bad decision is one decision away. Right. And you do your best. You do your due diligence. You try to do your, your best, just like in any paranormal investigation, you try to take your experience, your training and knowledge and deduce what just happened. I think that's yeah. a I think it's a that's a powerful example, um, Greg. And it's also it shows that you get in enough situations, <laughs> and that some situations are going to be like, okay, we killed it, it was great, and then some situations can be like, it didn't work out, and and then mm. it no matter what. And th this is paranormal investigation too. Like some situations, you're like, okay, we. You can't go on one and then determine the rest of your life around it. You can't be like, oh my God, I right. went on this paranormal investigation. All this kind of paranormal stuff happened. Everyone's going to be like that. Because, you know, the next 25 you go on, you're going to be sitting there in a dark room talking to a chair and like getting that on video. Like, hey, chair, I just want you to say something to my recorder here. And then you'll be listening to that back for eight hours and you'll be like, well, that was time well spent. Yeah, I, I sat in a tower cell uh, in Hunadora Castle or, or Corvin Castle over in Romania. I sat there for hours with a video recorder, analog video recorder, analog tape player, or tape recorder. Um, and this is a castle that Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tepes, oh was God. actually yeah. uh, imprisoned in when he was a young man. Cool. I don't know whether he was in prison in this particular tower cell, but could have been. <laughs> I, I'm really not. Uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. And then I go to a little house called Haunted Hill House in Mineral Wells, Texas, uh, and have five experiences and am uncomfortable enough to where I didn't want to go back there by myself ever again. Um, and now that I'm far enough away from that experience, I'm like, yeah, probably wasn't so bad. I'll go back. Okay. So, right. So yeah. what was an so, example you know, of something that happened? Man. What was it? So you've had to deal with real life horrors, right? Like we, mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't had to deal with real life horrors. 
Um, except maybe when the bar owner doesn't want to pay us the full amount that we were guaranteed by the contract at the end of the night. Like, we're like, oh, you son of a bitch. Um, well, does that so, happen? Yeah, oh, does, <laughs> yeah that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, not getting paid well for a band is a, basically a paranormal experience. Um, <laughs> no. No, getting paid well. Getting, right. I was going to say, yeah. So that, that's the, well. that was, I was okay. So, Greg, <laughs> so what kind of experience happened? What was one thing that happened there that you were like, I don't, wanna, the castle? I don't want to, yeah, like, I don't want to go back alone or, you know, that place in Mineral Point. Like, what happened that it scared somebody who has to deal with real horrors? Yeah, um, you guys can go and check this out. It's uh, on um, uh, Haunted Hill House in Mineral Wells, Texas. Uh, it's owned by Kathy Estes. And it was the brothel. This is this is confirmed stuff. This is something that I do um, as a paranormal investigator because of my background. I actually uh, correlate and confirm whether or not the ghost story makes sense. So the ghost stories at uh, um, Haunted Hill House make sense because uh, there is good written history behind them. Uh, at this place, uh, it was the brothel and the speakeasy for the Baker Hotel back in Prohibition. And um, they kept a lot of liquor over there, and uh, there were uh, there's at least six deaths that's attributed on site over you know a hundred year period, which uh, isn't a lot compared to a lot of stuff in the in Europe, but still it's there. And uh, um, so and we don't do need to I... compare ourselves to Europe because they have thousands of years, and we have right. only a couple hundred of written history. Obviously, the natives have. Well, you know, right, thousands. yeah. But right. The written history, like, they have an unfair advantage, especially in the UK. They Because they got Roman, they got Hadrian's Wall. That's not fair. They do, yeah. So here, um, one of the things I did was I, I, I bring a metal detector with me. I'm not going to go in with a K2 meter and do all that. I'm going to do the stuff that uh, paranormal investigators typically don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of fill in the holes. So I do some uh, um, uh, some open records stuff. I do uh, some online stuff. I talk to a few uh, people that uh, espouse to know about a lot of the stuff that happened there. And then um, I go in the house, secure all the, the electricity, um, and I let the house cook. I close it, and I go outside, and I use my metal detector in the back. Well, in the back, um, there's a trash heap in the back. And uh, additionally, I said... Uh, before that I use experts. So I got Gypsy Jules to come in uh, later and she worked that back area and she found condom containers uh, back in the uh, early the uh, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, they came in basically a smaller than a skull can, but hey, you know, I don't know. Um, right. Those guys who knew what they needed. They had, <laughs> they had a little metal top on them. So the cardboard rotted away and the lambskin condom that were, was in it, you know, rotted away. But the little metal uh, cap of I think it was three, uh, uh, three, what are women that die that uh, of those condoms, right? And uh, so that uh, kind of correlated with the, um, you know, possible of the, 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 uh, prostitution that was going on there. Sure. So ah. you correlate stuff like that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of going around doing that, that sort of stuff. And, uh, and so that night I went in and I, I use a particular technique to make sure that nobody can trick me. So I check all the doors and the windows and make sure they're all the way they supposed to be and take pictures of them and all that stuff. So nobody can sneak in on me and I'm, I check the walls and, and that sort of thing. See if there's any live um, uh, electrical conduit or anything in there that, uh, isn't secured by the main breaker. And I set up my, uh, my recorders and I go to a certain place wherever my computer is. And I sit there, uh, let my recorders record for about an hour. Then I go out and I swap everything out, uh, bring the recorders back that I have been recording, put new ones out there. And, and, uh, and while I'm downloading it, the other recorders are, are working. So you get a base, so, huh? You get your base. Like yeah, base yeah. recording, base levels, base everything. Right. So this is what it's like just to start. So then when weird shit starts going on, you're like, sure. this is the difference between this and the base. Yep. 
All right. And so I, I go out and uh, the downstairs bathroom door is wide open. Um, I check the door. I know uh-huh. how to close the door. <laughs> I know how to lock the door. I know how to, to measure, you know, uh, the penetration of the bolt into the hasp. I, I understand this. Um, and so I, I'm like, well, maybe I missed something. Right. So I check it again and close the door. And stupid me pulls out the camera and put an analog recorder in because that was my process. Mm-hmm. I, I stick with a standard process and I don't deviate from it, which was stupid in this case. <laughs> because I get the, I go and download my stuff. I come back out and the door is wide open. What? Nobody did that. I don't know what happened, but nobody oh. did that. Wow. Now, there were a couple of other things. I, I got hit with a rock on the back of my neck going down the interior stairs. And there just so, so happens to be a story of a young boy that lived there that was probably one of the prostitute's sons. Hmm. Uh, he um, suffered from Down syndrome, and he is known as a friendly ghost. He plays with people, and he throws rocks at people. That doesn't hurt, just messing with you right it makes you feel welcome yeah man i'm it's telling it's you rock, um i didn't see a ghost or a rock at me i'm saying i got hit on the neck with something mm-hmm. that when it landed on the stairs it sounded like a pebble would bounce a couple of times hmm. now this is in the pitch dark I, I, i'm not running any lights i'm not running anything uh it's just ambient light from outside and uh, i spent another hour up there just trying to figure out you know yeah. Is there somebody hidden in the walls with like a little freaking yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blow dart or something or, or what? Uh, but that, that was pretty amazing for, for me. That was, it, 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 it sounds really benign, but it's, it was something other than what I was expecting. But benign well, and unexplainable yep. is very different than benign and like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's going to be something fun. Yeah. And especially when you're the one that took all the precautions. So you're confident that what, you know, the scenario you were walking into was like pristine, basically not, you know, a lot of the investigations we do, we're entering areas that who knows, there could be like, right. you know, someone lurking in there. <laughs> sure. So yeah. That, I, that's situation cool. usually. Sounds right. good. Yep. Dude, Greg, yeah. thank you so much for spending, uh, tonight with us we really appreciate it everybody out there make sure you go visit greg's uh website author greg lawson.com uh, he's got some great books interesting like he's been in things that you've seen if you're obviously a paranormal and zombie fan all that kind of stuff um, yeah we could talk for hours greg this right is we so could fun. like thank you d- and we got to save some stuff for next time because like mj's like my favorite moment with greg was in texas on the tankawa in Indian burial Ooh, ground. Yeah. So we need to do yeah, more of that. A, yeah, that, that was cool. that was weird. That, that never. Yeah, it's a so good story. Those are the kind of things we have to uh, bring out next time uh, that we had talked to Greg. So everybody, check out Greg. Um, if you enjoyed the kind of stuff you saw tonight, uh, <laughs> Patreon.com/slash Sunspot Music is where you can check out what Wendy and I do every week which is have like Paranormal Tuesday. We talk about uh, these topics. And then Thursday, we have like a new music and stuff like that night. And we got a band. It's called Sunspot where we talk about it. We, <laughs> we play songs about paranormal topics. So please visit us there. Either way, make sure you're checking out Greg at Greg Lawson, author, author, I'm sorry, author Greg Lawson.com. Uh, he's fantastic. And, and yeah. And the Paranormal Detective YouTube and, channel. Greg there Lawson. we go. I wanted to make sure if you enjoy watching these paranormal uh, interviews, yeah. Greg has a, an excellent one that's weekly, right? Yeah, well, every Tuesday. Wow, uh, wow that's I'm, a little I'm, bit more I'm, than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm two hours before you. All right, so okay. you can have it. You can have your Tuesday night paranormal one two a party night with the paranormal detective, followed by see you on the other side. Oh my gosh, you get all the Ooh. all the weird stuff you could possibly want. Right? MJ's giving Oops, us an uh, yes. What more do you want? Awesome. All right, everybody. I, <laughs> have a great time. We'll see you next. We'll see you on, on, on Thursday, Thursday. And then, Greg, yes. thank you so much for joining us. Make sure to check out author Greg Lawson, Paranormal Detective, and patreon.com slash sunspotmusic. And we will see all of you 
on the other side.